Today I will start my new series, Rereading Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, by talking about the novel's first chapter, The Boy Who Lived. As it is the introduction to the whole series, it's not a secret that it is a very meaningful chapter. It is as well one of only five chapters which are not written from Harry's point of view. First chapters usually serve to wake the reader's interest in the story, introduce the main character and give an outlook on what there is to expect from the story. In the case of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, however, the beginning neither seems interesting nor do we get to know much about Harry himself, who only appears at the very end of the chapter. I must admit, when I was reading the book for the first time as a child, I found the first chapters terribly boring and did not gain interest until chapter 4. Nevertheless, the chapter does set two very important things for the beginning of the series. Firstly, it paints a vivid picture of the initial situation of the story. Harry's parents have been murdered, Voldemort is gone, and a new story is about to begin. Secondly, the wizarding community is introduced by presenting selected rules, characters and objects that represent it. It is highly emphasized that this magical community lives in tension with the non-magical Maga community, which is not supposed to know about the existence of witches and wizards. This is presented through two different perspectives in the first chapter, the point of view of a Muggle, Warren Dursley, and that of a wizard, Albus Dumbledore. Like this, a narrative technique is established that creates tension by revealing only a few details of information to the reader. But now let's take a look into the story. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley in number four Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. At first sight, the first sentence of the series seems very random. We do not get a lot of insight in the Dursley couple except that they are married and that they like to be normal. The surname has no particular meaning. It derives from a name of a town in Gloucestershire near where J.K.R. was born. She once mentioned in an interview that she picked it because it sounded dull and forbidding. On the Dursley's first names we can read on Pottermore. Vernon and Petunia were so called from their creation and never went through a number of trial names as so many other characters did. Vernon is simply a name I never much cared for. Petunia is the name I always gave unpleasant female characters in games of make-believe I played with my sister Di when we were very young. So, in a series where nearly every name has a special meaning, the first two characters introduced seem surprisingly random. The location of the home, number 4 Privet Drive, however, reveals a lot. Privet is a plant which is, according to Wikipedia, used extensively for privacy hedging and therefore symbolizes riches and philistinism as well as thinking inside the box keeping everything one does not want out of their lives their house number four underlines that as in numerology four stands for dependability productivity punctuality obedience conventionality and traditionalism in the following paragraphs, we get some more information about Mr. and Mrs. Dursley. Mrs. Dursley is characterized as superficial by her behavior, while her son Dudley seems nothing but an annoying brat. Mr. Dursley is presented as an upstart bourgeois, being the director of a firm called Runnings that makes drills. While Runnings probably derives from the old word to grun meaning to grind, and therefore simply describes the working process of a drill, the drill itself characterizes the Dursleys once more as monotonous and following the given path. And after all, what are drills doing? They are boring. <laughs> Later we witness some of the Dursleys' domestic life, in which traditional values loom large. Mr. Dursley is the family's bread earner, while Mrs. Dursley is a stay-at-home mom who is only interested in her child and gossip. However, Mr. Dursley has to think twice before daring to ask his wife something, so she obviously seems to be wearing the breeches. To the adult reader it is obvious that the description of the family is pure satire. But to a child as myself seventeen years ago, 
the Dursleys just seem awful and boring. The story, being perceived differently by children than by adults, is most definitely a recurring theme of the series' first books. Up until this point, an omniscient narrator has been talking to the reader, who now hands over the point of view to one and Dursley for the first part of the chapter. This is initiated with the line, On the dull, grey Tuesday on which a story starts. The dull, grey Tuesday probably is one more symbol for the boringness of Mr. Dursley's life. As all fandom agrees, these events take place on November 1st, 1981, and this day was in fact not a Tuesday, but a Sunday. Let's keep in mind it's 1981, to help us imagine the scenery a little bit better. We are in the times of the Cold War, Solidarność, and mass riots in the UK. Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister and Ronald Reagan US President. What the Dursleys probably did not mind. Mrs. Dursley, who didn't watch the news as we learn later in that chapter, probably cared more about the royal wedding of Charles and Diana that had taken place three months prior. The car Mr. Dursley drove to work was probably a Mercedes-Benz W123 or a BMW E21, and had he turned on his car radio, he probably would have sapped the way tainted laugh, don't you want me, as well as John Lennon's imagine. Back to the wizarding world. It is astonishing that the first look we ever get on the magical community is presented by one of the greatest muggles there ever was. However, there are three reasons why this makes perfect sense. Firstly, the reader does not know anything about the wizarding world yet, and its details have to be introduced slowly in order for the reader not to get confused. For example, the role of olds, any magi, cloaks, the Potter family, and who must not be named in the wizarding world is already subconsciously smuggled into the reader's mind during Mr. Dursley's day by the principle show don't tell. Even though he comments those things in a negative way, strangely dressed people about the get-ups you saw in young people. Remember, we're in 1981. The reader is fascinated and wants to know more. Secondly, like I mentioned before, withholding information that is only implied causes tension with the reader, who now wants to read on. For example, Mr. Dursley's nephew Harry seems to take a huge part in everything that is going on. Mr. Dursley tries to talk himself out of knowing anything about it, but trying to convince himself that his nephew's name is Harvey. The reader, however, has noticed the book's title and so knows that the name must be Harry. Thirdly, an explanation to why muggles do not suspect anything about the existence of witches and wizards is offered. They are all just too ignorant. You have to keep in mind that Mr. Dursley even knows that something like the wizarding world does exist and he still does not want it to be true. Furthermore, this is shown by the TV reporters Mr. Dursley watches on the news. They talk about diurnal owls and are irregular shooting stars but act like none of these occurrences are to be taken seriously and try to find reasonable explanations like perhaps people have been celebrating bond for a night early. The last quote points out Another function of the chapter. By the language, mentions of particularly British things like Bonfire Night, as well as the mention of British cities as Bristol, Kent, Yorkshire, and Dundee, it leaves no doubt that this story takes place in Great Britain. Watching the news finally, Mr. Dursley cannot fool himself any more. So he consults his wife Petunia, who in reaction denies that anything could be wrong. This seems to legitimize for Mr. Dursley to believe that whatever this means it would not affect his family. The reader, however, is immediately told by the omniscient narrator that he was wrong. After this reassurance by the narrator, we are finally introduced to the perspective of witches and wizards. As we have already heard about them from Mr. Dursley's perspective, there are some loose strings that are finally answered now. For example, the tabby cat that used to back Mr. Dursley is now revealed to be Professor Minerva McGonagall. She takes an important part from now on because the rest of the chapter seems to be from her point of view. Though some argue that Dumbledore is the narrator in this part, as he is constructed as the 
antithesis to Mr. Dursley, I opt for Professor McGonagall as narrator, as we have insight into her thoughts and feelings rather than Dumbledore's. She also seems to be the more adequate narrator here, as she, like the reader, wants to find out more about what has happened to the Potters. Dumbledore, on the other hand, is basically too omniscient to be a narrator at any point of the story. The curiosity and fear we see from McGonagall here is very interesting compared to what we are told of her later in the first books. This shows nicely that all we are told later on is dimmed by Harry's perspective. While we see a very different McGonagall here as presented later on, there are also a lot of continuities of her character. Sitting stiffly on a brick wall all day, for example, of the incomprehension towards Dumbledore's chill behavior in serious situations. When Dumbledore operates to private drive, she narrows her eyes to recognize him. This may be another way of characterizing her, or maybe she simply doesn't see him, because she needs glasses in human form. I wonder if the ability of sight is nullified by transforming into an animagus, or if it is still there. What do you think? Dumbledore's first appearance is marked by a detailed description of his exterior. He was tall, thin and very old judging by the silver of his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak that swept the ground, and high-heeled buckled boots. His blue eyes were light, bright and sparkling behind half-moon spectacles, and his nose was very long and crooked, as if it had been broken at least twice. This wondrous description is accompanied by the omniscient narrator's comment that Dumbledore doesn't fit into private drive at all. This observation supports the thesis that Dumbledore is in fact the antithesis of Warren Dursley. The extraordinarily normal versus the extraordinarily extravagant. This makes Dumbledore especially interesting for the reader, who probably already has antipathized with Mr. Dursley. Dumbledore stays really calm throughout the whole scene. Thus we are immediately confronted with one of his most important character traits. He does not panic about the whole Potter and Voldemort situation, like McGonagall does, and that behaves eccentrically by talking about the parties he has crossed and offering McGonagall a sherbet lemon, making out his second most important character trait. Despite his eccentric behavior, we immediately know that he is superior to McGonagall, not only because he likes to call Voldemort by his name, one of the themes playing a very important role in the whole series, already introduced here. Later, we get to meet Hagrid, another important character who already is introduced in this chapter. Hagrid is described as almost twice as tall as a normal man, and at least five times as wide. He looked simply too big to be allowed. Long tangles of bushy black hair and beard hid most of his face. He had hands the size of dustbin lids, and the feet inside his leather boots were like baby dolphins. This description gives the reader the impression of a stereotypically crude and careless man. But as we see him behave towards baby Harry and Dumbledore, we come to know that he actually is really sensible and has a big heart. He is one of many characters from the wizarding world who show us that appearance does not terminate what is inside a person. Hagrid enters the scene on his, aka Sirius, who has his first cameo here, flying motorbike. The motorbike appears amazing to first readers because it is a known gadget from the Muggle world and has been magicalized. This principle also applies to the Deluminator, referred as a put outer here, as well as Dumbledore's gold watch, which has twelve hands but no numbers and little planets are moving around the edge. There are some theories about this very watch circulating about the internet. The Reddit user Padawan Learner had a theory that Dumbledore is one of the select few who know about 12 planets instead of 8, and so have a broader knowledge of astronomy. This theory, however, is based on the wrong assumption that the clock has 12 planets instead of 12 hands. Another user, Crook Pencil, pointed out the mistake and added his own theory according to which the clock works similarly like the one the Weasley family owns. The hands and planets symbolizing people Dumbledore cares about, so that would explain why he knows Hagrid is late. This theory seems a lot more probable to me than the first one. In my opinion, however, I think the planetary movements just indicate the time like a normal clock would. The hands in this case symbolize the months. 
because the planetary movements vary in accordance to which month it is. But I'm not an astronomer, so correct me if I'm wrong. This kind of clock could probably have existed among wizards before muggle clocks were even invented. During the conversation between Dumbledore and McGonagall, we also learn that the shooting stars in Kent already mentioned on the Muggle News were probably caused by Deedle's Diggle. Diggle, a character we meet again later in the series, seems unimportant at this point. Carrie Nitschmann, however, points out in her book on psychoanalysis in Harry Potter that this is once more a scene that children read differently than adults. When a child would derive from McGonagall's statement that wizards are omnipotent, adults, at least according to Nitschmann, know that Daedalus in Greek mythology was the father of Icarus, whose son died because of his plans gone wrong. Thus, they know it is implied that Harry is not safe yet. I would even say that the relationship between Icarus and Daedalus could symbolize the relationship between Harry and Dumbledore, who later lets his protégé Harry face death. But this does not belong in this chapter. It is very notable that Dumbledore does not talk much about what has happened that night, only nodding or bowing his head as reaction to McGonagall's questions. About the parties of Sherbert Lemons, however, he talks a lot. I can think of three possible explanations for this behavior. 1. This is just another trait of his eccentric personality. But I do not really believe it, as Dumbledore later on appears as a very wise and reflected man. 2. He is shocked by the news of the death of James and Lily, and does not want it to be true. 3. He already knows more about the reasons for Voldemort's downfall, Harry's survival and about the connection it has built between them in that very night. He asks McGonagall's questions about why Harry survived with the cryptic, we can only guess, we may never know. It is possible that he indeed does not know it at this point, but equally plausible that he knows but does not want to tell. This is, after all, a behavior we know a little too well from Dumbledore. His remark about Harry Scar probably proving to be useful in the future strongly indicates that he already knows more at this point. He continues talking about his Scar that supposedly is a perfect map of the London Underground, a comic relief right here, typically Dumbledore, but not really contributing to the topic at hand here. McGonagall, who we get to know as much more human as Dumbledore, complains about Harry having to live with the Dursleys, like everyone with this much information of it. Dumbledore tries to explain his decision by putting Harry's character development and mental health first, not wanting him to be spoiled or to let his stardom get to his head. This is a fair point, but as Dumbledore admits to Harry later, he already knew where Harry survived then and that only a relative of his mother's blood would protect him. This is one more point to the cause that he exactly knows how Harry survived and lies to McGonagall once again about it. His careful choice of words, talking about Harry's future life with the Dursleys, as well as his last words towards the child, good luck Harry, along with the spark in his eye that seemed to have gone out, suggests that he exactly knew how Harry's life with the Dursleys would be like. At the end of the chapter, the omniscient narrator takes over once more, suggesting that all around the country people were celebrating, raising glasses to Harry, the boy who lived. What I finally understood years after I first read the book is that the phrase is a kind of stigma that sticks to Harry and produces expectations everyone has of him years before he even enters the wizarding world. Such a title may be a blessing and a curse at the same time. As we witness as Harry tries to live up to this pressure in the first and also in the following books. As Nitschmann puts it, Harry becomes a hero resulting from the attempted murder by Voldemort. He has not done anything consciously, but still everyone expects him to act like the hero he supposedly is. So these were my observations reading the first chapter of The Philosopher's Stone once more. I am not impeccable, but only an observant reader who likes to analyze and point out different readings. Feel free to correct me or share your thoughts on my analysis. As a little extra, I want to add that I went to Pottermore to research some more, but sadly had to realize that the new Pottermore does not even have articles in every chapter anymore. Instead, I found an art article, or rather a list, called 64 Thoughts We Had While Reading Philosopher's Stone Again. Quotation marks said wrong. The first 12 points concern the boy who lived, so I'm going to comment on them really quick. 
one. Ah, the dursleys and the drastically opposing amounts of neck. Okay, I always smile at that one. Two. Is McGonagall not bored sitting on that wall? Or cold? Well, she has more important things on her mind at that moment than being bored. Plus, as I mentioned earlier, I think the stiff sitting matches her character perfectly. 3. Dumbledore's here! He's here! Do they even know that Caps Lock suggests screaming? Okay, well, Dumbledore's there. Sad that's all they have to say about him. I do not think that it's one of his most brilliant ideas placing Harry with the Dursleys. 4. I wish I had a beard I could tuck into my belt. That's the dream. Agreed. If I could do magic, the handiest thing would be if I could turn out street lamps with a silver cigarette lighter, said no one ever. Oh well, it's our first glimpse of magic. We'll take it. And you never know, it might come in handy one day. And what is that point exactly? 6. Dumbledore has passed several parties and feasts when McGonagall has been set on a wall. Rub it in, Albus, missed the point. Again. 7. Daedalus Diggle, now that's a name and a half. Of course the shooting stars down in Kent were him. Okay, is this referring to the meaning behind the name or just the fact that it sounds funny? 8. How does nobody in Privetraff notice a giant motorbike making a great racket? Seriously? Like I elaborately discussed earlier, how many times does the chapter have to tell that muggles are ignorant and do not want to know about magic? 9. Oh hey, mention of Sirius Black, we definitely missed the first time! Well, yeah, but noticed reading for the second time like 10 years ago. 10. I wish I could see Dumbledore's London Underground Scar. Wish I had one myself. Disregarding the fact that it's probably only a distraction from what he had to say about Harry Scar, aka non existent. Yes. Please mind the gap. 11. Who leaves a baby in the doorstep all night? At least draw the doorbell. Okay, they have a point there. However, Dumbledore probably thought this true and came to the conclusion they would not accept Harry as they would unless they had no other choice and no one to turn to to push him off to. And they also could not have left him lying there at all. What would the neighbor think about that? 12. Dumbledore's eyes stopped twinkling. That may be the saddest thing I can think of. Well, I already addressed this one too. I would not describe it as sad, however, rather cunning and deceitful. He bloody knows that how the Dursleys are going to treat Harry. I do not feel any pity for this self-pity. Mm -hmm.